Is that sexy enough to get young Latinos to the polls, redistricting? I'm sure that's your, your opening gambit. Hey, help us out, register, go vote. Because, I, hey, we've got a redistricting coming down the line. <laughs> it's funny because we actually had, um, we were one of the census partners, and we worked very closely with MALDEF. And I'll never forget, it, Steve Grove, the census director, said, so you want to make census sexy? We're like, we're going to try. <laughs> and, with the help of, and with the help of MALDEF, and we worked very closely with iTunes, the Cabal, we actually, people understood it. And it was actually one of our most successful campaigns. And fundamentally, when you start talking to young people and say, look, this is about you, your family, and your political voice. Nothing is, ch I mean, as much as people keep talking about the 14th Amendment, SB 1070, all the stuff that's coming down the line, eliminating ethnic studies, nothing is galvanizing young people more than they are. And that's one of the reasons why you saw such a surge for the first time in a midterm elections that almost matched the equivalent of voting and participating in the, 20, in the 2010 midterms as 2008. I mean, that's, that's a big deal. So what, it's a matter of how do, you break it, how do you break up redistricting? How do you talk to them? It's funny because Nina and I talked a little bit before. And she's like, yeah, you know, they, we, Texas got four seats. And now they want to say, OK, well, the four seats, yes, we recognize it was because of the huge surge in, Latino, in the Latino uh, population growth. But you know what? We don't want to give it to the Latino population, but we also don't want to give our four seats back, right? <laughs> so they want it both ways. And I think what, it's a matter of how do you message to young Latinos and start talking to them about the importance of having that political representation. And fundamentally, they understand that. And they also want to see people that look like them representing them. And that's one of the big drivers behind redistricting, is how do you actually get politicians that look like them, that represent their values and their interests? And again, it's trying to make it sexy. So hopefully in the 20, come 2012 election, you know, we'll partner once again with Lou Lack and Maldef, and we'll, we'll work our hearts out. No, no pressure staff over there, OK? <laughs> I have to defend the sexiness of redistricting. <laughs> when you, you get shapely districts, salacious political talk behind closed doors. <laughs> <laughs> Census track data is where I squirm in my seat a little bit. Uh, Russell, what's the, what's the cross-community interest uh, with, with this? As uh, a Latino who works for uh, an organization involved in other civil rights campaigns, well, let me talk. I, I also think the, the census is very sexy. And the uh, <laughs> shows you how wrong a guy can be. Uh, uh, my organization actually did one of our most successful campaigns this last year, which we called Queer the Census, where we <laughs> distributed over 200,000 pink stickers that LGBT and allied households put on their census form and mailed it in because we too wanted to make the, the census sexy to understand that because so much of the federal government's resources are directed based upon what the census says, that it is a very important tool. And right now, there is no federal survey that collects information on the LGBT community in a broad-based way. Would you want a question? I mean, isn't that a, a sort of double-edged sword that would make people as nervous as empowered? Well, some people do say that, but it would also then not make us invisible, which is what is the case now across the U.S. where LGBT people are systematically invisible because there's no federal data collected on them. And, and data that is collected by research, research institutions, universities, and even an organization like my own is not held to the same standard or level that federal, federal data collection is. So uh, it, you know, it could... You know, you know, we, we have this in our, in our own organization of, do we put our name on the outside envelope of stuff that we send to our constituents? Because there is a longstanding fear of the closet. And are, are we going to be outing people to their postal carrier? Hmm. Right? That, that, well, so that's, a real, that's a real right? concern, it's a, right? it's, a, it's a real fear. And so, but Especially there in are, the absence of housing protection yes. uh, and, and other civil rights laws in That's a lot right. of jurisdictions. That's in right. And in over half of, or a majority of states in the United States, it is still legal to fire someone because of their sexual orientation or gender identity. And although we, you know, organizations like mine and in, in concert with organizations like MALDEF have tried to work to secure these types of protections in municipalities and in states, it's still, you know, it's still a gamble for folks um, to come out and to live their lives openly and honestly without fear of being fired simply because of who they are.